Nehemiah chapter 5 is where we are in our study. We've been marching through the book of Nehemiah and getting through the, uh, to this wonderful book about this, this, this great man. It's, it's a great book on leadership. It's a great book on, on how, to, how to lead people. Nehemiah was a, was a wonderful, a stellar example of what a leader ought to be. Somebody who didn't sit in an ivory tower, but somebody who got down and got his hands dirty, worked with the people. Nehemiah was one of those people who said, don't work for me, work with me. And I like that. I like, I like it when, when the leader gets involved. And Nehemiah was one of those people. He, he could have sat back in his, in his cushy little job back in the palace in Persia, but no, he, he, he asked for a leave of absence. He went to Jerusalem and he got right in the middle of that rebuilding of that wall job. And so we're gonna look at Nehemiah chapter five today and, and look at some other characteristics of this great leader, this great man that God raised up to help the children of Israel. Let's have a word of prayer. I'll give you a brief introduction to, to get us up to speed and then we'll continue on in chapter five. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this day. Another opportunity you've given us, another day of life. Lord, another year, my goodness, another year is just slipping by. And, and as the time goes by and the years go by, Lord, we have to stop and realize how faithful you have been to bring us to this point. And we thank you for that. We pray that you'd bless today in this hour. Help us as we open your book. As always, Lord, please teach us something, not just so we can have a head full of knowledge, but something that would help us to be better Christians. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Nehemiah. As we stated, in, uh, is a book about Nehemiah was, was, was a Jewish fellow who was the cupbearer to a Persian king. He was in Persia, living in the palace, had a very nice job, a very cushy job. But he, you know, he, was, he was the one who would taste the food and taste the wine before the king would eat to make sure that it was okay and nobody was going to poison him. Kind of a dangerous job too, by the way. But he lived in the palace. He had the best of food. He had nice clothing. He was right there next to the king. So, you know, he, he, was, he was very well cared for. And one day he heard that the Jews who had gone back to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity to rebuild the city, he heard that they got the temple up and running, but the walls of the city were down and the gates that were burned by, by wicked King Nebuchadnezzar had not been repaired. So Nehemiah got very burdened about this. He was bothered about the fact that back home in Jerusalem, where he was from, there was no wall around the city of Jerusalem to protect the city. The gates that were destroyed, they were wooden gates, they were burned by Nebuchadnezzar when he destroyed the city. The gates had not been replaced. And so the city was vulnerable to anybody who wanted to come in at night or, or during the daytime and, and rob the place or give the people trouble. So here's Nehemiah who, who could have just said, well, God bless those people, I'll be praying for them. Instead, he was bothered by that. So he went to the king and he asked for a leave of absence. The king saw that there was something bothering him and he asked him one day, he said, what's the matter with you, Nehemiah? He said, I don't think you're sick. He said, it looks like something's bothering you. He could tell by the look on his face. And Nehemiah said, well, the, the city of my father's sepulchers lie in waste. In other words, he was saying that his hometown, Jerusalem, you know, a Persian king could care less about the Jewish temple. A Persian king could care less about the city of Jerusalem. I mean, he wasn't a follower of God. He wasn't, he wasn't somebody who, who, who was interested in Jewish traditions and Jewish temple. So Nehemiah used his brains and instead of saying, hey, my hometown where the temple is, is, is needing some help. He said, the city of my father's sepulchers. In other words, my hometown where all my ancestors are buried. Well, that would appeal to anybody. I mean, a fellow feels bad about his hometown, about a place where all his ancestors are buried. So Nehemiah used his, his wisdom when he asked the king for a leave of absence to go back to Jerusalem. He called it the city of my father's sepulchers, lie in waste. So the king allowed him to go and he gave him uh, 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 letters to go with him. So as he traveled along the way, if anybody was gonna try to stop him or give him trouble, he could say, hey, I'm on a king's mission. The king gave me permission to do this job. I'm on my way to Jerusalem. He gave him a letter to the keeper of the king's forest to give him wood so that he could bring materials to build the gates. So Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem and he starts building the wall. And in chapter three, we listed all the different people who helped him and all this list of names of these people, all kinds of people got involved, men and women and, and nobles and rulers and just common folks. Everybody got involved in this job of building this wall around Jerusalem. And then last week we talked about the opposition. 
There's a man named Sanballat and another man named Tobiah, and, he, and they came by and, and they started ridiculing the people. Ah, oh, the, these feeble Jews can actually rebuild these walls. Uh, I give them a day, they'll quit after a day's labor. You know, they'll, they'll see how, how monstrous this job is and they'll give up. And so they started talking trash to these people while they were trying to build this wall, trying to discourage them, trying to, and you know, then, then they, 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 they criticized them for the material. They, can use. they said, they're gonna build a wall with all this rubbish. And then they said, even if they built a wall, a little fox could run across the top of the wall and probably knock it down. They're not gonna have a very strong wall. So all this opposition from without was coming to try to discourage the people. And Nehemiah prayed and he asked God to take care of the, of, of the he didn't stop work. He didn't go out there and try to debate or argue with these people. He just got on his knees and prayed and asked God to help him and he kept on working. And that's what we saw in chapter four. Now chapter five, we come to the place where now, we, you know, whenever the enemy fails, to bring discouragement from without. You know, Sanballat and Tobiah, they tried to you know, discourage these people by, by taunting them, by threatening to come and invade them. Hey, while you're working on the wall and while you're not paying attention to what's gonna go on, we'll sneak up on you, we'll attack you while you're building a wall. All these things from without started coming in. But whenever Satan cannot attack from without, then he turns around and starts to attack from within. Uh, and the, the way he does that most of the time is through selfishness. You know, people that are selfish, it's all about them. It's my desires, what I want to do. It doesn't matter what anybody else wants to do. It's a very selfish thing. And that's one of the ways that Satan can attack from within is to get people to become selfish, get people to be, think about themselves rather than the good of others or the good of the whole project. And that's what was going on here. So look at uh, Nehemiah chapter five, and we'll read uh, just a few verses and then we'll, we'll continue on. Nehemiah chapter five, verse one says, there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. For there were that said, we, our sons, our daughters are many, therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also that were that said, we mortgaged our lands and our vineyards and our houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. Verse four says, there were also that said, we've borrowed money for the king's tribute and that upon our lands and our vineyards. And yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children and lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them for other men have our lands and our vineyards. Now right here, the Jews were crying out, not against all the enemies around them, they weren't crying out about Sanballat and Tobiah and all these guys that kept coming up there and, and talking uh, uh, negativism and trying to bring opposition and ridicule to the big job that they had ahead of them, but they were crying against their brethren. That's what verse one says, there was a great cry of the people and their wives against their brethren, the Jews. So what's going on here? Now you think, oh, okay, here's this bunch of Jewish people. They're trying to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. They're trying to rebuild the gates. And now they have opposition from without. And not only do they have opposition from without, now they've got some fighting going on within. And they were complaining about their Jewish brethren. Now what happened was their Jews were exploiting other fellow Jews. The rich people were exploiting the poor people. Now this is not people who aren't Jewish, these are people that are the same nationality and same religion, the Jewish people. And it's kind of crazy. Now there's four groups of people we see here in chapter five. First of all, there were people who just needed some food. The, the verse two said, there were that said, we, our sons and our daughters are many, therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Then there were some people who mortgaged their lands in order to buy food. That's what in verse three, it says, some were here that said, we have mortgaged our lands and our vineyards and our houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. They were so poor, they didn't have any money to buy food. The only thing they had was their family home that probably been passed down from generation to generation, needing money, needing to have food for their families. They mortgaged their homes in order to buy food. Then another group said that they mortgaged their houses to pay their taxes. Look at verse four, they must live in California. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, verse four, there were also them that said, we have borrowed money for our king's tribute that upon our lands and our vineyards. So some people, they had, they had so many taxes to pay that they mortgaged their lands in order to pay the taxes. And uh, so now you gotta ask yourself, well, who are they mortgaging these lands to? Well, it wasn't the enemy. That was not the problem. 
The problem was that they were mortgaging their lands and they were borrowing money from fellow Jews. Richer Jews were exploiting these poorer people because they needed money to buy food, they needed money to pay for their taxes. So what they did was the wealthier crowd of the Jewish people that lived in Jerusalem was loaning money to these poor people and they were taking instead of, you know, for collateral, they were mortgaging their lands and their houses and their vineyards. Well, that, that's the roof over their head. That's, that's, the, that's how they provided for their food, the, the vineyards. They planted the, the, the grapes and the vines and, and, and the corn and all the kind of thing. So they mortgaged those things because they were starving. They needed some food. So now here's the thing. When wealthy Jews loaned money and they took this land for collateral, they were going against the law of Moses for the Jews. Now, it's okay to lend money to each other, but they were not supposed to charge each other interest. That was a law that God gave to Moses and Moses set it forth. Let me read it for you in Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy, if you just want to write the reference down, you can look it up later. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 19 and 20. Here's what, here's what Moses told the children of Israel. Thou shalt not lend upon usury, that means with interest, to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Unto a stranger thou mayest lent upon usury. In other words, you can loan money to a stranger and charge him interest. But unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to do in the land, whither thou goest to possess it. So here, God told Moses to tell the children of Israel, now this is a Jewish thing, okay? He said, I don't want you to charge each other interest when you loan somebody money. He said, now it's okay to do that to the, to the Gentiles, to the people that lived around, you know, the, the people that weren't Jewish people, people that didn't believe in the Lord God, Jehovah. He said, but amongst yourselves, he says, I don't want you to do that. He said, don't, don't borrow money from somebody and, and have that person charge you interest. That's, that was the law of the Jews. So here, Nehemiah comes over here to build the walls around the city of Jerusalem. And after he's there for a while and he's working, he's hearing about this problem going on. He's hearing about these poor Jewish people who are mortgaging their homes and their lands in order to get food. And the problem is they weren't mortgaging them to the heathen around there. They were mortgaging them uh, to, the, to the wealthier Jews. And that was a problem. These, these, they were exploiting the poor people to make themselves rich. Now, anybody who's read the Bible for any length of time knows that God has a very deep concern for poor people and widows. I mean, you, you can't help but read the, in the New Testament when Jesus walked upon the face of this earth. He was always helping out poor people and widows. He had a soft spot in his heart. Some people think that Joseph, you know, Mary and Joseph, the, the, the ones, his, his stepfather, that some people think that Joseph must have died early on in Jesus's life because we don't hear much about him. And also because Jesus had such a tender spot in his heart for widows, people often speculate that maybe Mary was a widow because you don't hear much about Joseph after, you know, after Jesus was gotten to be an older child. You know, they called him Joseph the carpenter's son and we, all, we understand all that. But later on in life, we don't hear anything about Joseph. So a lot of people speculate that maybe Mary was a widow because at the cross, Mary was there, but Joseph didn't show up. Maybe he had already passed on. But either way, God has a special tender place in his heart for poor people and for widows. If you read the Bible, you'll understand that. Now here, you have these Jewish people, these wealthier Jewish people taking advantage of these poorer Jewish people going against the law of Moses. This is not what they were supposed to do, but they were charging their brethren interest and they were taking their lands and holding their lands as collateral. Now that made Nehemiah very angry. Look at verse six. Nehemiah said, and I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Now, somebody said, well, you know, Nehemiah has been here building this wall for quite a while. Why didn't he do something about this sooner? Well, first of all, he was very busy building a wall. I mean, Nehemiah didn't come there to reform all the problems in Jerusalem. He came there to build a wall. And then another reason why maybe that, that he didn't act any sooner on this, because he had really hadn't been in Jerusalem all that long. You know, after you're, after you're in a place for a while, then you start learning a little bit more about where you are. When you first come in, you, you don't understand everything. And I'm sure Nehemiah was so busy building the wall and fighting Sanballat and Tobiah and all this opposition that he had. And now that he's been there for a while, 
And now that he, he's, he's heard what's going on in the area, now the word has come to him that, hey, there's some poor Jews in this city who have had to mortgage their lands in order to buy food. And Nehemiah got to thinking, well, that's not right. He got angry because the people weren't following God's law for the Jewish people, as we just read there from Moses. Then look at verse 7. Nehemiah said, then I consulted with myself. You know, when you run into a problem, one of the, one of the most first things you ought to do is stop and think. I don't know how many times I have put my foot in my mouth. Somebody comes and tells me about a problem and without checking it out and without going to find out what maybe there's some other side to the story, I come in there like a bulldozer and rush into the middle of a problem and I start trying to straighten it out and then later I find out, well, there was a little bit more things going on. Well, Nehemiah was a lot smarter than I am in many other ways, but he was a lot smarter than I am that when he heard this problem, the Bible says, he, he, Nehemiah says, I consulted with myself. In other words, wait a minute, let me stop and think this thing through. Let me try to, un, let me try to get, you know, uh, let, let me not be too hasty to hop in the middle of, of a conflict. You know, and that's something that we all need to learn. We need to learn that, you know, when I, I, look, I, I like to get things done. I like things to click. I like things to move along. I got a job. Let's get this job done. Okay, now let's go on to the next thing. Let's get this job done. Okay, let's knock it out. Let's go on to the next thing. So when the problem comes up, I just want to go in there and attack it. You know, let, let, let's, just, let's just get it now. You know, don't, don't wait till it festers and becomes a big problem. That's not always the wisest thing to do. So Nehemiah, when he heard about this problem, about these richer Jews exploiting these poorer Jews, he stopped and he said he's consulted with them. Himself. In other words, he thought it through and he wanted to make sure that he was going to do the right thing. Then he says, I, I consulted with myself in verse 7, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, ye exact usury, remember that word usury is like interest, you exact usury every one of his brother, and I set a great assembly against them. So he gathers the, the people together and he, and he tries to appeal to them. He tries to say, first of all, you know, this is not the right thing to do. Look at verse eight. And I said unto them, we, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren? Or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. Here, he uses the term brother. He's trying to appeal to these richer Jews. He says, wait a minute. He says, you're doing this to your brethren. You're doing this to other Jewish people. You're doing this against the law of Moses. So he was trying to appeal to some of their sense of, of, of national unity, of, of, of their family uh, way of thinking. But then he really brings it home to them when he says, hey, he says, you know what? Our Jewish people were in bondage in Egypt and God used Moses to deliver us out of the Egyptian bondage. They were hard on us. They treated us cruelly. They made us work like slaves and they made our life difficult and, and unruly. And then we went into 70 years of captivity under wicked King Nebuchadnezzar. And he treated us cruelly and he used us for his own uh, kingdom and his own pleasure and his own power. And now you're gonna turn around and put your brethren in bondage to you? You see what he was doing? He was, he was, he was trying to paint them a mental picture. You know, Egyptian bondage, God had to deliver them. Babylonian bondage, God had delivered them. And now you who in, in your families who were one time in bondage, now you're gonna turn around and put each other into bondage? What was he talking about? Because he's talking about this thing of the richer Jews taking and using the uh, interest and, and mortgaging the lands of the poorer Jews. It puts them in bondage. Debt, how many times have you heard Pastor Wilkerson say, debt will put you in bondage. When you owe a debt, you owe somebody, you have a promise to upkeep, and that makes you bound to those words. When you buy a house, you sign a piece of paper with the bank and you say every month for the next 30 years, I promise that I will make this payment. Well, you're bonded to that bank. You owe them. You said that you would do it and you sign. So here, uh, Nehemiah is trying to appeal to the fact that, hey, we're all Jewish brethren here. You know we went into bondage before in our history and our past, and now you're gonna put each other into bondage? That's what he was saying there. He says, uh, just to make, and by the way, just to make money, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a thing where you had this, this wicked uh, Gentile uh, nation that came up against them and put them in bondage. This was their own Jewish brethren, their own people, their own flesh and blood, their own family, so to speak, that were putting each other into this financial bondage just so that one group of people could make money over another and exploit these poor people. 
These, ta- these wealthy Jews were motivated by greed and they were ignoring God's law. See, Moses explained that to them, that when you get into the land, don't charge each other interest. Go, it's okay to loan money to each other. Help, help somebody out if they need some help, but don't, don't make them pay through the nose for it. Don't, don't, don't charge them interest along the way. Now you can charge interest to the other people, but don't charge your brethren interest. And so this is exactly what the people were doing here. And it made Nehemiah angry and he gathered the people together and he tried to appeal to their sense of national unity and the fact that they were brothers. He keeps using that word over and over again here. Your brethren, your brothers, your family, you guys are all Jewish people. Don't do this to each other. You know it's not the right thing to do. Now, these wealthy Jews were ruining the testimony of God's people. Look at verse 9. Also, I said, it's not good that ye do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of our heathen, of the heathen, our enemies? He says, hey, he says, what are the heathen people going around us going to think when they hear that here, here's, here's this Jewish nation living in Jerusalem and it's not the fact that they can't even get along with each other, but they're exploiting one another. You got the rich people taking advantage of the poor people. He said, if, if for no other reason, you ought, if you don't want to do it because that, that you want to bypass the wealth that you can gain, or if you don't want to do it because you're going to try to ignore God's law and you got a problem with this thing, if for no other reason than for the testimony of God's name and God's people. These heathen people around Jerusalem are watching us. And you guys are going to go out there and try to, 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 to put your, your, your poor people in bondage by mortgaging their lands and taking their property just so they could buy food? He said, what kind of a testimony is that going to be to the people around Jerusalem when they hear that that's going on in here to your own people? You're doing it to your own people and, and the word is going to spread around and you're not going to have a good testimony in, in the area. So that's what they were doing. They were ruining the testimony of God. So Nehemiah then set the example. Look at verse 10. Nehemiah says, I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray you leave off this usury. He says, I'm, I'm asking you, I'm begging you, please stop charging these poor people interest in order to loan them money so that they can buy food. He said, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just begging you to please do this. Look at verse 11. Restore, I pray you to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses, also the hundredth part of the money of the corn and the wine and the oil that ye exact of them. He said, look, he said, this has got to stop. He says, you need to give back these people their houses, their land. This is how they make their livelihood. This is how they make their income. You take a person's land and you take their house and you take their vineyard and you give them some money for that so they could buy food. That's just going to fill a temporary need. Once the money is gone, the hunger is going to still be there. But now you don't have your house over your head. You don't have your vineyard that you can go out and, and, and sell your, your grapes and, and, and your plant, your uh, wheat fields and all, all your orchards and everything that you have. So you're going you're gonna to fill a temporary need, but down the road, there's going to be other needs come up, and now you're not going to have any way of doing that. And Nehemiah was appealing to these people, don't do this. This is disastrous. This is terrible. First of all, it's against God's law for you, and he pointed out Moses' law, but he said it's also, it's just you don't do this to brethren. You don't do this to family. Well, what about the testimony of God's name around here? So he's telling them to restore them, and he's pleading with them. And then Nehemiah reminds them of the judgment of God. Look at verse 12. Then said they, we will restore them and will require nothing of them, so we will do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. And I shook my lap. And I said, so God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise. Even thus he be shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did according to this promise. So here, Nehemiah had had told these people, he said, look, he says, you need to stop doing this. You need to quit doing this to your own people. And he took his, his, his robe and he shook his robe out like he's shaking the dust off of it. He said, and so be it to you if you don't follow this law. He said, I'm telling you, this needs to come to a halt. And finally, the people realized what they were doing. 
they realized it was wrong. It was against God's law, but it was also wrong to do that to your own brethren, to your own people who were suffering and needed, and needed food to, to put food in their mouths and they were willing to mortgage their lands just to buy food for their home. Now that's pretty poor. Uh, but and so, so finally, Nehemiah got these people to wake up and realize that you can't do this. Now here's Nehemiah. He's in Jerusalem, supposed to be building a wall. He told the king that he needed a leave of absence so he can go build a wall. And he ends up over there being like a judge trying to quell all these problems around there. But you know what the thing that you have to stop and realize is that Nehemiah, although his main task was to build that wall, he also wanted to help the people. You know, well, that, Nehemiah could have said, well, you know what? I'm not here to deal with these political issues. I'm not here to help, you know, I'm here to build a wall. That's my job. Leave me alone. You've got issues with, with your other Jewish brethren. Go find somebody else. Go, go, go before a judge or go find somebody to help your problem out. But that's not how Nehemiah's heart was. Nehemiah, remember I told you the book of Nehemiah is a great book on leadership. And we see the godly example that Nehemiah was. Yes, Nehemiah had a job to do. His job was to build a wall and rebuild the gates around the city of Jerusalem. He was not there to be the governor. He was not there to be the overseer of the people. But yet, if there's a problem, and Nehemiah thought he could help with the problem, he was very willing to step in and take over the problem. But you know what the thing is, he got to stop and also realize with Nehemiah is he personally was like that. It wasn't like Nehemiah, you know, so the people could have criticized Nehemiah. The people really could have had a lot of criticism against Nehemiah for coming in there. Well, who are you coming over here to Jerusalem and trying to boss us around? Who are you to come over here to Jerusalem saying that, you know, you're going to help us rebuild this wall? You got this cushy job back in the palace. When you get done with this job, you're going back home. You don't have to live in Jerusalem. You don't have to be here. So why should we listen to you? Why should we even care about you? Okay, Nehemiah, thanks a lot for coming and helping us. But the bottom line is you're not going to stay. You're not going to live here. You got, a, you, got a, you got a nice job back in the palace. You're the cupbearer to the king. And, and you're going to go back and live in the palace and dress in the fancy clothes and eat all the fancy food. So why should we bother to listen to you? Well, you know what? Nehemiah was a very wise man. Realizing that the people might perceive him that way, Nehemiah went one step above and beyond the normal call of a leader. And he wanted to show the people his real heart. He wanted to show the people that he had a heart for Jerusalem. He wasn't there just being sent by a foreign king to help out this foreign nation in order to get their walls rebuilt. He wanted to show the people that he really cared about Jerusalem. And he goes on to do that as we continue reading in chapter 14. I'm sorry, verse 14. Moreover, in other words, on top of all of this that Nehemiah has done, the fact that he left the palace, took a leave of absence from his nice cushy job, came and traveled all the way to Jerusalem. He's been working with his hands, rebuilding a wall. I'm sure a guy who's a cupbearer to the king is not gonna have a whole lot of calluses on his hands. So now he's working on this wall. He's probably got blisters on his hands. And he's, but he said, moreover, on top of all of this, verse 14, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year, even unto the two and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king, that is 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. Nehemiah says, okay, people, he says, I'm here to tell you to quit exploiting your poor Jewish friends, your family, your brethren. He said, but I'm here to tell you my heart's in this thing. He says, as I have been here as, as a temporary governor of this area, overseeing the rebuilding of the walls around the Jerusalem and the gates, I have not ate the bread of the governor. And what he was telling him was, I did not take a salary for this job. Nehemiah was trying to show the people where his heart was. He wasn't there to personally make money. He just rebuked the, the wealthy Jews for exploiting the poorer Jews. You know, don't, don't be charging these people interest and taking their lands and their mortgages just so they can, you could loan them money so that they could buy food. Nehemiah wanted to show them that he also was not there to exploit these Jewish people. You know, when you start to point your finger at somebody and point out their problems, you better make sure you don't have those same problems in your life. They always say, when you point your fingers at somebody, you got three of your own fingers pointing back at you. Well, Nehemiah had just got done pointing out to these people that they were being selfish and they were exploiting for personal gain. They were loaning money to their fellow Jewish brethren. And so Nehemiah wanted to show them who he was. 
He says, ever since I've been here, he says, I, at the end of verse 14, he says, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. I have not taken the normal governor's salary for this job that I'm doing. Look at verse 15. But the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people and had taken of them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people. But so did not I because of the fear of God. He said, hey, he said, you've had leaders here before. He said, they've taken a nice fat salary from you. In fact, they've taken all kinds of stuff from you. They've taken bread and wine and silver and they had their own servants set up to be rulers over you. And they're supposed to be the public servant. You know, that's one of the gripes that we have with these politicians. They're supposed to be public servants, but instead they rule over the people. And Nehemiah said, look, he says, I, since I've been here, I have not eaten the bread of the governor. I have not taken the normal salary. Your other governors took them, and they took a lot more than just a salary is what he said there when he says they took bread and wine and 40 shekels of silver and even their servants bear rule over the people. But Nehemiah said, but not me. He said, I didn't do that because of the fear of God. Why did Nehemiah leave that cushy job in the palace as the cupbearer to the king to begin with? Because he cared about Jerusalem. He cared about the Jewish people. He didn't look at that as an opportunity to go over there and, and collect an additional salary. He didn't look at it, I mean, he's being paid by the king to be the cupbearer. He took a leave of absence. He's going back to his salary. He's going back to his job. He could have looked at this like, oh, hey, you know what? I can go over there and rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem and I can put some extra shekels in my pocket because after all, when I go over there, the, the, the king's gonna appoint me temporary governor of the land. And after all, all the other governors got paid. Nehemiah says, no, no, not me. He says, I came over here and I did not eat the bread of the governor. I did not take the money like your former governors did. He said, because of the fear of God. He said, I came here to do a job for God. I did not come here to exploit you. And so if I'm not here to exploit you, I don't expect you to be exploiting your other fellow brethren Jewish people by charging them interest when you loan them money so, so that they could buy food. So Nehemiah was going one step above and beyond his, you know, that's one thing I appreciate about our pastor. Our pastor, you know, when, when he came to this church 11 years ago, you know, the church was in a lot of struggles. The church was in financial struggles. I don't know if many of you know this. If this is being taped, tell them to edit this out of the tape, okay? Brother Matt, thank you. Uh, I'll share this with you. Just, this, this is just me and you in this room. You're, you're, my, you're part of my Sunday school class. Let me tell you one of, the, one, of the, one of the greatest reasons why I respect our pastor so much. He reminds me of Nehemiah. When Pastor Wilkerson came here 11 years ago, the former pastors were given cars to drive that the church paid for. The former pastors had all kinds of extra little benefits. And Pastor Wilkerson came in here and said, you know what? He says, our church is struggling financially. He said, I will provide my own car. I don't need the church to buy me a car. He said, and from the day, from the day one, when, see, one of the benefits of the people that work for the church here is that if, if, if they have children in the Christian schools, the children go to the Christian school, they pay the, their registration fees, but they're not charged the, uh, the, the tuition fees. Pastor Wilkerson has paid the tuition for every one of his children out of his own pocket from day one. He says, how am I gonna sit in my office and have people come into me with financial troubles and saying, Pastor, it's so hard to keep our kids in the Christian school. He's gonna be able to look and say, yes, I understand all that. I know it's hard to keep your kids in the Christian school. He could have taken that benefit, but he didn't. And Pastor Wilkerson could have taken the benefit that the other pastors have had when, when, when the church provided them a nice automobile to drive. Pastor Wilkerson says, I will, provide, I will provide my own automobile. He says, I will pay my own children's tuition, although I don't have to. It's, it's part of the rules that the deacons have set up for all the employees of the church. Since the church employees, you know, they don't make a lot of money like the people out in the world do. Let's at least help them with their kids' tuition. And a lot of pastors said, no, I have paid for every one of my kids' tuition from the day I set foot in this church and became the pastor. And then when Pastor Wilkerson, and here, here's, here's uh, Nehemiah, says, you know, he says, I have not taken the, the, the salary of the governor. Now, you say, well, why didn't Nehemiah take the salary of the governor? Because he was being paid by the king of Persia. He just took a leave of absence. He, his, all his needs were still being provided for him. Do you, let me show you a little something. Do you know what Pastor Wilkerson does when he goes out and he's invited to speak at another church, like on a Friday? 
or if he goes to a, to a couple's retreat or something like that. Whenever they give him a love offering for going speaking somewhere, when he gets back here to the church, he puts it all back into the church in the offering plate. He says, I'm, I'm being paid by this church. I have a salary. This church is providing for my needs. So if I go out and minister to another church somewhere and they want to give me a love offering, he says, sure. He says, it was, it was given to me. It wasn't given to the church. I could stick it in my pocket, put it in my bank account. But Pastor Wilkerson puts it right back into the church. He says, you know what? He says, I'm already on, on the church's time clock, if you want to look at it that way. He says, I'm already being paid by the church. So if I go out to speak somewhere and they give me a love offering, he says, I put it back into the church. I look at that and I'm thinking, this is, this, is, this is not the norm, okay? But see, that's why when Pastor Wilkerson 10 years ago was pushing me to come and work for him here at this church, I told my wife, I said, you know what? I said, it would be very difficult for me to move at, this, at the time of life where I was. My house was paid for almost 50 years old, had a nice church, family members, grandchildren, children out there. I said, but to move all the way across the country to go work for somebody, I wouldn't do that unless I knew that person. But you know what? I told my wife, I know John Wilkerson. I know him. He's, he's probably one of the best Christians I've ever met. And when I read about this section of Nehemiah, how that he was over in Jerusalem and helping these people, he says, I didn't take the bread of the governor. I didn't do all that. And look at verse 16. Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall, neither bought we any land. He said, I could have taken advantage of that. I had money. I have a salary from back at being the cupbearer to the king. He said, I didn't take advantage of you people by buying your lands. I could have made a bunch of money by buying these poor people's land so they could have food. And I could turn around and sell the land later on when the land. He said, I didn't do that. Look at verse 17. Moreover, there were at my table 150 of the Jews and rulers besides those that came unto us from among the heathen there about us. Now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox, six choice sheep, fowls prepared for me once in 10 days, store of all sorts of wine. Yea, for this required not I the bread of the governor because the bondage was heavy on his people. He says, I fed not only myself, but I fed 150 of the people that came with me on this job. He says, I paid for it out of my pocket. It didn't come from the bread of the governors. Why? Because the bondage was heavy upon this people. He says, you folks are in trouble, and I know that. I didn't take a salary. I didn't take advantage of buying cheap land when I could have, like, like, like your Jewish brethren were doing to you. He said, besides that, I fed my own self and 150 people daily because of the bondage. I wanted to give back because I love this work and I wanted to do this job. And then look what he says in verse 19. Think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. He think, wow, what a leader. Well, you know what? My pastor reminds me of Nehemiah a lot. He, he reminds me of somebody who's unselfish. Somebody who could, how many times have the deacons gone to them and say, Pastor, you've got a large family. You need to go sell that house you're living in. Go buy you a bigger house. You need a bigger house. No, he says, I'm fine. We're good. We're good to go. And, and you know, you got to, you got to appreciate that unselfish heart of a leader. And that's what Nehemiah was. He could have taken a salary. He could have taken advantage of buying this cheap land to these people who were, had their backs up against the walls and needed to mortgage their land for food. He had money. He could have taken advantage. He said, I didn't buy the land. I didn't take advantage of you. I didn't take the salary because the bondage on the people is that because I love the people and I love the work, I wanted to put into the work, not take from the work. And so we, when we read this section of a chapter of Nehemiah, I always think of my pastor, Pastor Wilkerson, when I, when I read this section here, because that's his heart. His heart is for the people. He's a, he's a godly leader, just like Nehemiah was, that didn't take advantage of anything. He was there to help and to help these people do this job.